Hey everyone, in our last project we used the Arduino IDE and a TTGO T-Display ESP32 to create a simple project using a DHT22 sensor, completing a particular task. Decided how to be physically constructed, assembled, added more support libraries, blueprinted rudimentary user interface for the program, evaluated our work at regular intervals, added more features and refined our code to meet our goal, and eventually met all the parameters that determine the completion of this project. But it wasn't quite that easy, because if you remember, from video 1, we had all the prerequisites that had to be met before we were even able to start this project. This including added the additional board manager URL, searching and installing ESP32, universally selecting the particular board for the Arduino IDE, installing further support libraries required by our hardware, and then configuring these libraries globally with regard to Arduino IDE. And all that work got us a rainbow on the screen. We still had to install add-ons to allow data to be pushed to the device and support a SPFFS. And while Arduino IDE is pretty awesome, once you do get it up and running, you do find that for the more advanced user, it's missing a lot of medium to advanced features. By design to stay simple for beginners, it doesn't really have many features at all. I want to talk about another IDE that I use called Platform IO. This solves for a lot of the problems that I deal with with ESP32 development. There's a degree of misinformation out there as to the complexity of this IDE and who it's appropriate for. I'd like to dispel some of this information. And for the constraints of this example, I'm going to drop in this program. I'm going to cut and paste our program from the last example right in. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get the entire thing up and running from installation to operational and cut and paste the program right in. And then we're going to show the benefits of platform IO and some of the things that it can do and its advantages. So let's get started. Since both IDEs are going to require a USB serial driver installation for Mac and Windows, I'm including that small section from the first video in the series, so you won't have to go to a separate video for that information. Mac and Windows are going to require the CP210X driver listed at this URL here. Also in the comments below, choose the one you need and download it. Linux doesn't need any of this nonsense, so if you have Linux, don't worry about it. Once you've installed the driver on the Mac and rebooted if necessary, you could open up a terminal window, plug in the device, type sudo-s, and then dmesg, check the output to see if the driver latched onto the device. In the dev directory on the Mac, you'll see tty.slab underscore USB to UART. This will confirm that you're ready to use the device. We select that device for the port on the Mac, and in doing so, we should be ready to go. Then we see the uh, CU Slab USB to UART. On Linux, plugging it in and typing DMESG will even tell you the name of the device that it is bound to, in this case, TTY USB 0. And we can see looking at the port config on the Linux box, one of the available options on here is in fact DEV TTY USB 0, as we know is bound to the interface that is our ESP32. As it says here, Platform I.O. installs on top of Microsoft Visual Studio Code. So we're going to install Visual Studio first. So we'll direct our web browser to code.visualstudio.com. Link also provided below. It should choose the appropriate download for your computer, though you can uh, choose which download you want. Break it down for Mac, Windows, or Linux. If you're going to use uh, RPM for Red Hat or Deb, Ubuntu, or what have you. Download the correct one, choose the stable one, especially if you're new to this. Save that file or execute an install file, whatever is appropriate for your operating system. Conduct the installation of this program however you install this program on your operating system. This is just how I do it for the Mac. Installation is completed and now we're going to open it up. First thing we're going to do is the program opens. We're going to click on extensions here, this icon with the four squares. And we're going to type in platform IO, one word. And we're going to see platform IO IDE in the results. We can see this one come up. And we're going to click the green install button. And we're going to wait for this to install. It's going to take a little bit to accomplish. And the platform IO installation is complete. Just make sure the show it startup checkbox is clicked. Actually, exit out, let mine load again, make sure everything's working just fine. We can now confirm connectivity to the ESP32 by clicking on devices, as shown here. And we can see that device CU Slab USB to UART. This entry right here should look like mine. You can click refresh if you want to, but that confirms everything's looking good. We're just going to kick this off by pressing new project. 
choose an appropriate name for our project as all the boards are loading. Notice we didn't have to install anything specific for ESP32. It's just all taken care of automatically for us. Currently, as we select boards, we see 810 available, and we could scroll down forever and ever to try and find a board. But in actuality, just by typing in the first couple letters, I can see TTGO, LoRa32, OLED, V1, and that's the version 1 board, the one that I'm using. So I just select that right now. That's all I have to do for the board. That's done, configured, finished. For framework, we're going to use Arduino, which is exactly like the Arduino IDE, the way that we uh, program that. It's going to allow us to drop in our program. ESP IDF is an entirely different way and would not be compatible with our program. And we hit finish. While the project is being constructed, it provides you some information in the wizard about uh, important subdirectories and configuration files. We're going to get into these individual areas in just a bit. Scrolling down from the main landing just off to the right, as I go to the bottom, we can see in recent projects that new project that was just created. We could also see it open in the Explorer just off onto the left hand side as well. A quick glance under source reveals main.cpp. And as we open that up, we see it looks exactly like a file we would expect to see in Arduino IDE, except in this, we will always see an include Arduino.h. This is required and is one of the exceptions that we will have in Platform IO. So now we're going to look at one of the most important files in the project, Platform IO.ini. And we could see that some of the information has already been filled out when we initially created this project, saying what type of ESP32 device and what type of framework that device would be. And you could get really complicated with this file very quickly, have multiple devices, multiple frameworks. We're assuming one device. And I'm going to add monitor onto this. We're basically saying for the serial output, what's the speed? On Arduino, we actually have to go and do a drop-down list from the serial monitor to set the speed. But we're saying for this project, for this device, this is the speed we're going to set. And while this project didn't post to the serial, we're going to create a few examples. Like I said, I'm going to copy the entirety of the program that I made in Arduino IDE. And we are going to paste it right into main.cpp. The only thing that we are going to preserve, obviously, is include the Arduino.h. So I'm just going to paste this in. And then I'm going to go and relocate that include into the location with the other includes. Given time, we could see that there are three errors. We would expect that there would be a couple of errors. Um, they should be obvious, and we'll discuss them now. And it stands to reason if we build this project from the ground up rather than cutting and pasting it that we would have already made these libraries available for our hardware such as DHT and we could see that the library was not detected and that's one of the two errors we're finding here. I could click this icon right here on the bottom left for a summary of easier viewing of all errors and warnings and it's telling us what we already know we have to install libraries. The third error listed is just a catch-all include error. In Arduino, if you wanted to install a library, you globally installed a library for everything, for all hardware, one version, and that was it. This is pretty much how it was done. Made things easy, but not very flexible. We're going to see how to do it now in Platform I.O., and we're going to click on the Libraries icon on the main landing. In the search bar, I'm going to type DHT. And yes, for specific hardware, obviously, it's going to take a little bit of research to figure out what library is going to go to what piece of hardware. For our purposes, DHT is what I'm going to search for to pull up the library for the DHT libraries. And we could see the DHT sensor library for Adafruit comes up first, happens to be the same library we used in Arduino IDE. And so I click on this to drill down for more information. We see the same examples that we saw provided on the uh, web page for Arduino, but more importantly, let's take a look at the installation section. Long story short about what they're talking about in installation is we're going to use the platform io.ini configuration file to say build in these libraries into each individual project instead of globally installing this library into platform io and making that one library available to all projects. That way within each individual project you could say I want to use this version of the library or the latest version of the library and what have you and you could pull that version or the latest version or a specific version that you specify into a particular project. So I demonstrate this new field in platform io.ini lib underscore depth equals 
you need two spaces before you begin a list in this configuration file. So space space. And I write DHT sensor library exactly like the installation tab called for. But as we switch back to main.cpp, we'll see that the error for DHT still persists. We'll want to use this button for compile but not push to device to build that library into our project. Looking at the output of the build, we could see that the DHT library was pulled into this build. Also, we could see the dependency graph also shows DHT being pulled in as well. Of course, there's still going to be an error in the compile. This should come as no surprise. And we could see TFT library is going to be an issue, but we're going to click on the error button on the bottom left just to have a better look and see. Again, we could see the TFT library not being found as the error and the all-inclusive include error is shown. But if we look back on main.cpp, we see that we've cleared the issue with dht.h. So we're doing good. We'll address the last library and we should be good to go. We're now going to add the library tft underscore espi for odd display. And we search for that. It comes up as the first one. Let's select that now. And again, we're going to take a look at the installation tab to see how the install is recommended. We're going to find that it's the same as before to add it to the live depths option so we can locally build it in as we compile the program. We'll take a look at what the name of that is. And we can see under live depth is going to be TFT underscore ESPI. Let's do that now. Now we'll recompile. And our code is compiled error free with all dependencies and no modification. We'll remember back in Arduino IDE, we globally configured what board we were using for TFT ESPI. This was board 25, the TTGO T display that I've highlighted here. But if I actually open up config 25, we see that there's a series of parameters that make up that configuration for the TTGO. Those parameters are going to need to be put in our configuration file for platform IO for our project. So it knows what type of display we have and how to reference all of that information. These parameters will go into an area called build flags in platform IO.ini. I create that now and then we'll copy it right over. I had the first parameter user setup loaded and then all of the other parameters below with a dash D followed by the parameter and the value is shown. I'm going to add a link to these uh, configurations in the comments below. So we hit the build button again and we see that because we changed the config file, everything is completely refactored. It's a complete rebuild and it was a success. So we're going to hit the upload button to the right of it, which is a build and push to the device activity. that was successful let's have a look at the device as one would expect there's zero change in the functionality of the device it operates just as it did when it was compiled and pushed on Arduino IDE I'll be continuing this video with a follow-on video that's going to discuss an issue I found with the interrupt and GPIO zero which this button that I'm currently showing is connected to also we're going to get a more in-depth look at the IDE of platform IO itself talk about some features adding in your own personal libraries as well as uh, adding data to SPIFFS. So do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. Hit that subscribe button for more videos. Again, I'll post that link in the top right when new video comes out. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply?